Look at the trailer of the movie From Russia With Love and you will see a position very similar to this. They just, uh, they added two more pawns in that position. So it looks just a little bit different. But because of the fantastic finish of this game, they decided to use this position in that movie. So the next game that I have for you guys is uh, Petrosian against Spassky World Championship game match 1966. Petrosian is white and he con started with knight f3. They say if you want to become a positional player, there are two, three players that you should study their games. Smyslov, Capablanca, Petrosian. These guys were super positional. And of course, Karpov perfected all their uh, styles and then he came up with his own setup. Karpov is another one that in our contemporaries they recommend. So Petrosian opened with knight f3. Knight f3 is a good flexible move on the first move. You don't show your hand as to if you play an e4 and you may face Sicilian, if black is a great Sicilian player, or d4 going into Slav, Queen's Gambit, Tarash, Benko, King's Indian, Queen's Indian, so many options black has. But with knight f3, black has to keep guessing as to what opening is this going to be. It's a very good flexible move. And for the same reason that this is a good move for white, knight f6 is also a good flexible move for black. Knight f3, knight f6. When it comes to hypermodern chess, in hypermodern setups, players rarely show their hand as to how many pawns, if any, they're going to put in the center. And this game is a good example of that. So Sp Petrosian played g3. He wants to fiancele his bishop first and then decide with the central pawns. Black did the same, g6, bishop g2, bishop g7, castles, castles. So if somebody likes classical development in openings, he would not understand the, game, the way these two players have played so far. Classical opening says, occupy and control the center. Well, he's not, neither side has occupied any of the four central squares. So black just paid attention to the, and white king side development and finishing ki the king side development. But under hypermodern development, this setup is perfectly acceptable. So here, white played c4. So the first move by a player to put a pawn not in the center, but close enough. Typical response these days against c4 is either black plays in the center with a symmetrical c5, which is perfectly good, acceptable way to play, especially if black is playing for a draw. c4, c5 has notorious for being drawish. Or if black wants to play in the center, like me, may play e6 and d5. Classical players do that a lot. This is like a Karpov way of playing. Or if black is a Gronfeld player, he may play c6 and d5. Or if black is a King's Indian defense player, he may play d6 and later on either e5, which is purely King's Indian setup. Or if white plays d4, for example, uh, play knight bd7 followed by e5. Of course, c5 is also playable, but after c5, d5, we have a Benoni setup. The setup is not really called King's Indian because of this pawn formation. It's called Benoni. And if black plays e6, it's called modern Benoni. If he plays e5, it's called check Benoni. So there are different ways that players could play. So on c4, black played knight c6. It looks a little bit odd. Usually you want to push the c pawn and then bring this knight out. And that was probably the recommended way for black to play. I definitely would have done that. <clears throat> so white played d4, makes perfect sense, possibly d5 coming next, and black played d6. Uh, 
how many moves we played for each side one two three four five six for white and six for black so it's white's move nice c3 this game was played in 1966 and around that time there was a particular variation of king's indian defense that was uh, gradually becoming popular all over the world and that was called the pan of variation of king's indian defense named after a player Panoff, who played this and popularized this quite a bit. The idea is for black to play a6, rook b8, and b5. Since white doesn't have a, a white square bishop on this diagonal, on e2, usually in classical lines of King's Indian, white doesn't have as much pressure on b5. So black is expanding on the queen side of the idea uh, uh, of the board. And uh, we're almost 50 years from this game. And this is still the most popular setup by black, pawn of variation against King's India. Now back then you could only see it against the G3 in the G3 system that black would play. But I've seen this game, uh, this particular setup has been played against uh, Samish also, against Samish King's Indian defense. So this move is very tempting, but white should pay make a little bit more precautionary moves like h3 like e4 like bishop e3 next and try to resist pushing these pawns as much as possible that's my style anyway but pushing immediately is perfectly playable d5 now where should this knight retreat knight e5 is not so good because after knight takes pawn takes e4 and bishop e3 white will have the better position and these pawns can beautifully advance on the queen side Knight to b8 has been played before, but that uh, gets black behind in development. Black is still trying to take advantage of the fact that the light square bishop is on g2 instead of this diagonal and put pressure on this pawn. So knight a5 with the idea of attack on this pawn. Now, this is the only drawback this knight that is going to be misplaced for a while in the pawn of variation of King's Indian defense. But in compensation, black gets to expand on the queen side. Once white defends this pawn, usually with knight fd2, Korchno used to play this move and it got into tr trouble a few times, so he decided not to play match. Black will play c5, rook b8, b5, and black's compensation for this misplaced <coughs> knight is expansion on the queen side. And this position is very double-edged. A slightest mistake and either side could lose a pawn. So why to play? Knight d2 is the best way to defend the c4 pawn. And sure enough, black played c5. Why to play queen c2? This is a typical queen regrouping move that white does. And then he can decide how to continue. He could play e4 next. He could play b3, bishop b2. These are typical plans by white. Even knight d1 at some points is possible to defend this pawn one more time. So on queen c2, <coughs> these days you see rook b8 as a common move with b5 coming next. Here, for some reason, Spassky decided to play e5. And this, this move, after this game, lost its popularity. e6 has been also recommended in order to exchange these pawns and put less pressure in the center. But Spassky played e5. Optically, this position looks good for black. There are locked up center, central pawns on the C and D files. And this is what black likes in order to expand on a king side expansion with F5 usually. The center is stabilized, not much is happening. So pawn takes pawn is possible, of course, but it will play into black's hand and black could capture either with the bishop or pawn, both are perfectly playable and put more pressure on this pawn if he takes with the bishop. It opens up g2 bishop all the way down. Right, but this square is, uh, once black plays rook b8, this bishop, even though it's completely open, is not really attacking match. And it's attacking what we call airy nothing. It's all open, but it's attacking nothing, airy nothing. So uh, Petrosian decided not to do ampassant here. On black's e5, he played b3. Of course, we've got to keep this in mind that 
The D5 variation of King's Indian defense these days, especially in the classical lines, it's called Petrosian variation. He loved this move, D5. And he knows exactly how to handle positions like this. And he won many brilliant games. So I played B3, and of course the idea behind this is not only to defend this pawn one more time with a pawn, because black is gonna play rook B8, B5, and put more pressure on it, but also to play bishop B2, and then bring this rook to the center, and then strike and attack in the center. That's white's long-term strategic plan. Black to play, knight G4. You also may see knight D7 at this point, and the idea, of course, is to play F5. Knight G4 is a little bit provocative move. It's asking white to play H3, for example. And of course, black's idea behind this move is to play F5. And if white plays H3, chances are knight will go back to H6 and F5, and black gradually shift his pieces to the king's side. But white played e4, this is the move that he was planning to play anyway, gaining more space, and sure enough, black played f5. Okay, so whose position do you prefer to have at this point? For those of you who play Kings Indian defense, you probably like black's position, like me. But not counting the game result of the game, which I think uh, was a little bit mishandled by Spassky, uh, this game could have easily probably uh, be won by, by black. This is black's ideal position in Kings Indian defense. We have three fouls that is very stabilized, nothing is happening, and black is expanding. This pawn is a lever, f5 and it has all the hallmarks of a good attack by black. On the other hand, what is white's attack? White doesn't seem to have an attack here. And if it's not careful, f4 might be coming next. And it's black who is expanding. It's just a matter of finding the right combination of sacrifices for black. So I personally prefer black's position here. But I think Spassky mishandled the position. So far it's okay the way he's played. But from this point on, he created some complications that it did not work against superpositional Petrosian. It's white to play, and he played, he takes f5. Every King's Indian defense player knows that black must recapture with the pawn, because there's a saying, never give e4 square to white in, in a King's Indian defense. And if black recaptures with a rook or a bishop, this knight will, uh, yeah, this knight can go to e4 now because this knight doesn't have to defend this pawn anymore. And white will have a fantastic position because he owns the e4 square. White just cannot, black should not give that square. So black recaptured with a pawn. So far it's all fine. <clears throat> white to play, knight d1. One idea behind this move, it could be to play f3 instead of h3, and f3 also prevents blacks pushing these pawns. And of course, he could play bishop e2 anytime. It's black to play, and black played b5. Reasonable move. Usually black plays rook b8 followed by b5, but in this case, since the knight retreated, that means one fewer attacker on b5 square, so black gets to play his b5. White to play f3, expected, right? Now, this is the moment that I think Spassky went wrong. What I think Spassky should have done was knight h6. Even knight f6, followed by knight h5 would have been possible. But Spassky unnecessarily complicated the position. He overestimated the power of this square for his knight. So he figured if I push this pawn and my bishop attacks the rook, chance that he's gonna play bishop here, I trade bishops, then I take over here and I will own this square, which is true. 
But the drawback to this plan is that by pushing this pawn and trading this pawn, this pawn becomes extremely weak, isolated. And black will have two isolated pawns here, and this pawn is hindering development of his light square bishop. So strategically, that would be problematic. So he went with this plan, and I think this is the faulty move, a faulty idea at this point for black. He played e4, sure enough, white played bishop b2, and he captured on f3. White captured with the bishop, and black traded dark square bishops. White took with the queen, and black played knight e5. Okay, this is what Spassky was planning, to have a beautiful knight on e5, which truly it is. And now he did this three times against two defenders, and he may even take the bishop. Or he may even push e4 next. Black would be happy to trade this pawn with one of white's pawns and open his light square bishop diagonal. So white doesn't want to give up the bishop, and he doesn't want to give up this pawn. So what's his move? Bishop e2. 9 out of 10, in a situation like this, bishop retreats back to g2 again. But in this case, he has to keep an eye on this pawn too. So bishop came to e2, and <coughs> doesn't f4 lose the pawn? Okay. F4 exclam. The idea of this move, of course, Mitch has only seen this game 10 times before, so <laughs> it's no big deal. And you may want, guys might wonder, wow, how did you see this move of a former world champion? Yeah, it, just looks good. <laughs> it does have all the hallmarks of a good move. It will activate your, your light square bishop and that's a very important factor. So it's white to play. Again, your opponent sacrificing a pawn. You're not sure if you take it or not, accept it. But if necessary, be willing to give it back at the right time. He took with a pawn. And now black complicated the game even more by playing bishop h3. OK. This is 1966. Six years after this game, Spassky becomes world champion. And Petrosian is already an old, experienced player. He's been world champion before. And uh, I believe might have been a world champion at the time, Petrosian. So it's a battle of a, some great player against some great player to be. This move is interesting. Anything wrong with pawn takes knight now? Queen g5 check. Queen g5 check. That is, is a deadly check. White's only move is king h1 and queen g2 mate. So there are some traps in the position. What should white do? White, not that he had a great deal of choice, but it's still the continuation was fantastic. First he got the knight, uh, knight off the back rank and he connected his rooks, so he can recapture. Now, would rook takes f4, rook takes queen g5 work? With the same idea? No. Why not? Rook f4, rook f4, queen g5 check. Rook g4. Rook g4. What is it? So, after rook g4, he cannot play queen e3 because rook is pinning the queen to the king. It seems to be good, right? But it isn't. Right. Why not? Rook takes, rook takes, queen g5. What does white do? What is it? Rook g4. And after bishop takes? Knight takes. And after knight, after queen takes? What do you mean, queen takes? There's a bishop on 
Okay, knight takes. Queen check. So, threatening check. Very good. And that's why black didn't do it. So, on knight e3, black decided to win the rook. Bishop takes h3, bishop takes rook, and rook takes. Okay. They say it's a good idea to assess the position after a few exchanges have been done, after position changes dramatically, like from opening to middle game or from middle game to end game. This is a good moment to analyze the position to see who is better by how much and all that. <clears throat> it's black to play. And black White is just about to capture the knight. So black play knight g6. This is an example of defense and attack at the same time. It's white to play. What should he do? If you push the pawn, you get some space. Trouble is knight comes back to this fantastic square. And you probably don't want that. Or well, black could throw in a check and win this knight unless he blocks. So black will have a comfortable position. Check actually may not be oh, so knight good. Right knight g2 now? Or okay. <coughs> right, most people, they just hold on to this pawn and the only way to defend it is knight g2. And it's an okay move. But it's too passive. Right, it's, it is kind of passive. It's moments like this that you can tell how great the players are, that they see a little bit deeper than just defending a pawn. King H1. Strategically, black's king is more vulnerable than white's. They're both on the open G file, but because of this diagonal that white queens has against the black king, white is better off and black's king is more vulnerable. So here, white came up with an ingenious idea of, uh, of a plan. Sometimes the way to visualize a plan is if you could pick up a piece and you put it in a fantastic square on the board, that's a plan. You start with your strongest piece, queen. Where is the most ideal square for this queen? Looks like already is doing a good job on this diagonal, right? Uh -huh. So you go to the next piece, rook. Rook for the moment is defending this pawn and it's, it's fine for now. So rook is fine too. Bishop, where do you like this bishop to be? The best square on the chessboard. Of course, e6. And that's how you think of planning. Wouldn't it be great if I could make two moves in a row? Bishop g4, bishop e6. Wow, I have a winning position already. How but about, how about uh, knight, g4. knight g4, knight h6? Okay, knight g4 is threatening knight h6 mate. Right, trouble with knight h6 is that black would defend the h6 square with queen h4 and then attacks the knight too. So you don't want that. You want to create real threats against the black king. So white played bishop g4 anyway, despite the fact that white will win this pawn, not only win it, but also controls the e6 pawn by playing, and that's what black played, knight takes f4. Of course, this knight is a great defensive piece on e6. So Spassky already sacrificed an exchange when he left the bishop on f1 and let black take it. And here he goes for a second exchange sack. There are, there are probably about a dozen games in history of chess that somebody makes double exchange sack and wins brilliantly. This game is one of them, one of the top six probably. So black must take, and now bishop check. And what are black's options on this check? <coughs> Okay, let's look at each option. If king f8, how does white continue? Queen h8. Queen h8. King e7, the only move. Queen g7. Seven. King e8, the only move. And how does white continue? Queen g5 check. Actually, on queen check, g7, king oh. here, Queen G8 back, and after King E7, Queen G5. 
on queen g8 check, if he plays king e7, queen g5, attacking, so block nine with the rook, then knight e4 or knight f5, right? So white should, should win. So that's why black played rook f7. He is willing to give one of the exchanges back. Rook f7. So it's white to play now. And what should he do? Knight e4. Not only prevents queen g5, but also threatens what? Knight f6. Knight f6, he could take, uh, right, that's a check, right? He cannot take with the queen. Knight f6 check and followed by. Yeah, probably he wants to bring more forces. White's miners are dancing beautifully. In the meantime, look at this major piece. Black has three major pieces, and this is very inactive. Knight e4 played, black to play, queen h4. To have an eye on the dark squares, and the king has extra escape in the squares in case he needs d8, and also attacking this knight immediately. Has all the hallmarks of a good move. On knight f5, what does black do? Queen e1, king g2, queen takes knight check. Yes, yes. So yeah, that's going to mess up, mess up the plan. Yes, so knight f5 is the slow. White to play. A lot of people have a hard time finding a good move for white at this point. There are many options, but you have to see through the whole thing, the, how to finish black off. Queen to f6. No, no. He will take. This is a queen take. Queen takes. Uh, on queen takes, queen takes, knight check, king f8, and black is fine. At most, you can win one of the exchanges, or maybe a pawn too. Well, you will take the rook now, and then check him with the knight d6. You have that option. Rook takes, very tempting. Check. King takes, check. Followed by another one of these, knight to f5. So black is going to experience some nightmare nights. In the meantime, these two pieces are out of the game for the moment. The question is, can white do something tangible? A lot of people have a hard time finding white's next move at this point. Not queen, d queen d f2? No. Queen f2, he will happily trade. Again, last thing you want to do in an attack is to trade pieces, especially queens. The rook on has been another queen. Right. Of course, you have to be careful that black can defend the other rook with one move, either here or rook f8. Probably not rook f8 because he might escape with the king. But once he does this, black seems to be fine. And it's just a matter of walking the king to the center. So, what move would you say is good for white. First things first, this knight is hanging for the moment. So this is the one you should be thinking about first. That check is very tempting, but it doesn't do anything. Knight g3? Knight g3 is an OK move too. Queen to g2. Queen g2, king f8, and then no good follow up. King takes. Yeah, you have all that. King. And then the queen's going to come F8. in. King F8. Right, right. King F8, the only move in that case. King, king F8, Queen F3, check. King G8, Queen F7, King H8. Knight. This. No, it doesn't work. Yes, drop. This is where analysis comes in and calculating variations. There are many tempting moves. I mean, I personally go for knight g3, but... Knight g3 is a perfectly fine move. But uh, <coughs> anything wrong with knight takes pawn? For some reason, nobody suggested this obvious move. Well, you would think, it, no, it's got, it can't be that simple, well, right? Because you're going to lose the knight with the queen check at e1. You're going to lose the e3 knight. Yeah, but it's not with check. No, not necessarily. Because on knight takes knight queen e1, he can always block with the knight. No, queen takes f1. The rook is protected. Oh, that's right. So he, never mind. He doesn't have that option. 
So a knight d6, queen e1, king g2, queen takes e3, bishop takes f7. I just had queen g2 check first, and then bishop takes rook. Now remember, white, black's queen ended up here, right? Yeah. So knowing that, with the white knight here and the white bishop here, black will lose his queen. Can anybody see the combination? After oh yeah, there's a fork. He plays bishop takes check. King f8, King f8 the only move. Queen h8 check. King e7. Knight from d6 goes here check, forking the king on e7 and the queen on e3. But king d7. And then another check with the queen and then captures the, the queen. The bishop was on f7, you can't check. Let's see. Yeah, we need to go deeper. Let's look at the check. King here. Oh, knight takes d6. Queen check there. And queen takes. White has a winning combination here. Let's see. Check. King f8. Check. King e7. Check. After king d7, he throws another check first. And if king c7, then another check, take or here, and then capture the queen. Yeah, the so black bishop. will lose his queen. Yeah, without moving the pieces. What happens if queen takes bishop? Oh, if queen takes bishop, that'd be a lost game. Yeah, d -d 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 queen so takes, pawn takes, takes, king takes, takes. No, but the queen takes the rook. Right, queen wins the rook. If queen takes if check, check, pawn takes check, yes. black king black takes, black and now he can take the rook. And black and white wins. <laughs> so in other words, this idea of queen check and winning the knight does not work for black. So the move that white played in the game was knight takes d6. This is such an obvious move that for some reason, when I first went over this game many years ago, I kind of discounted it too. I said it can't be that obvious, that simple, but that's exactly how it was. And it's devastating because of its simplicity and the fact that it's so effective. Knight takes d6. So how many ways is white hitting the f-brook now? Twice. So what is black's obvious move? Rook where? Rook a7. Rook a7. You can just say rook a7. Okay. After rook a7, now you see the real combination in this whole game. I'm sorry. After knight takes d6, black throwing this check. Queen g5. So what is white's move? Knight to g4. Knight to g4 is also playable, but for what white has in mind, he played king h1. What I, what I mean by white has in mind, he wants the black queen to stay here. So black played the obvious move. Now, to give you a clue about the combination in this position, Petrosian was famous as the one of the most defensive players in history of chess, right? At the very top level. Now, isn't it odd that Petrosian had more queen sacrifices in world championship games than any other world champion? Queen H8 check. Not right Not now. Yet. Bishop takes F7 right check first. Bishop takes F7 check first. First, you need to do something else. Queen H8 check immediately doesn't work. King takes. And after knight takes, rook takes. So bishop takes F7. And if rook takes, which he did, isn't that a one of the, this is one of the most beautiful queen sacrifices in world championship games. One of the most, the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful. Isn't it fantastic? Wins the whole rook. Of course, he gave up enough material, but at the very end, he is going to have two knights against one knight. Easily winning the game. Let's look at black's options here. Instead of rook takes bishop, what if black had played? And by the way, by the fact that 
in this position, black continued. My guess is that Bespasky completely overlooked Queen H8 check. Otherwise, he would have resigned here at that level. They don't get to entertain the audience. Once they see a winning combination is coming, they resign. So the fact that he played rook takes bishop, my guess is that he completely overlooked Queen H8 check. But let's see what if black had played the, an alternative move, king here. How would white have won in this position? Queen h8 is the obvious and good move. And after black's obvious move of king e7. Well, knight c8 check, king takes bishop. And after knight takes here, black may even have perpetual check. So you got to be careful about that. His king is very vulnerable. Now knight e5? No, after queen h8. Oh, after queen h8 check. Very good. Yes, because white will have another beautiful queen check. This is how white would have continued. And I check. The, well, unless he wants to sacrifice the queen. Queen takes, takes, take the bishop. But then there is a skewer at the end, losing the rook again. So that's losing also. And of course, king here loses to queen c8 checkmate. So black really didn't have too many choices. And that was beautiful, beautiful queen sacrifice in a world championship game. You don't get to see very many queen sacrifices in a world championship game. Was there any queen sacrifices in a world championship game after this game since 1966? No pressure, I guess. Did uh, Kasparov did do any? He did queen sacrifice? Yeah. But queen for nothing? Well, <laughs> didn't capture any piece, right? The Beautiful finish. Yeah. What is? <laughs> hope you guys enjoyed the game. We come back in the second hour, and hopefully we can uh, convince the GM to show one of his own games now. Yeah.